I'd like to welcome everyone to Trend Spotting, Benchmarking the Present and Predicting the Future of Marketing. I'm Peter Coppell, the president and founder of a direct response media planning and buying agency, Coppell Direct. My intention today is very simple. I've compiled a vast amount of information, including the latest statistics, research, and best practices in marketing to provide you with information on the latest marketing trends that you can use today and in the future. I have a lot of information to cover, so let's jump right into it. Today's omni-channel universe of marketing is very complex. Uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, a multi-channel approach, how I define it, to sales is, is, that, is, is a, an approach that provides the customer with a seamless shopping experience. Whether the customer is purchasing through a brick and mortar retail location, through a mobile device, or through a desktop. This is all being driven nowadays by consumer behavior where the power has shifted from the consumer, from the marketer to the consumer. And the consumer has to meet the marketer at the time and place of their choosing. Uh, both consumers and marketers have an overwhelming amount of choices nowadays. The consumer wants to make an informed purchase decision and the marketer wants to use the optimum media mix to achieve their financial goals. This presentation looks at what's happening online, through mobile, social, and also retail. Let's begin with offline. Uh, that includes TV and radio. There's really a large drive towards digital, but it's worth noting that radio and TV have the largest domestic audiences with AM, FM radio attracting 240 million consumers and um, with uh, TV um, at 226 million. Compare that with smartphone usage at 191 million and PCs at 162 million. Regardless, those all represent enormous opportunities for marketers. We all know that, that there's generational shifts going on in marketing. Um, this shows the percentage each form of media consumption uh, against different age groups. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, notice the slide numbers aren't coming up. Um, uh, TV still dominates in all categories, but it's particularly strong among the older demographic the 50 plus that spends 59% of their time with TV. Meanwhile, millennials and generation Xers spend significantly more time with their smartphones. While it may be true that radio and TV still rule in terms of audience size, there's shifts going on and they're happening quickly. Overall TV viewership is declining slightly, but still leads with an average daily viewership time at four hours and 31 minutes. There's a slight decline against the younger, younger demographic, but TV viewership is actually up among seniors and baby boomers. Smartphone viewing is up from 60% from 62 minutes a day to 99 minutes a day, year over year. All you have to do is look around you to see evidence of people staring at their screens as they're almost run over by cars. I even saw a couple recently who were out on a date and they were totally ignoring each other, both looking at their smartphones. It's also interesting to note that half of the US households have video on demand services like Hulu, Netflix, or Sling. And get this, Nielsen suggests that 50% of the drop in US TV viewing was a result of, of Netflix uh, last year. And then finally, domestic cord cutting um, is estimated to rise to 22 out of every 100 homes by the end of the year. 
And cord cutting refers to ditching your cable service for an a, a la carte TV service. Um, I've seen figures where that number is up to like 37% among millennials. The other behavior we're seeing have a huge impact is that nine out of 10 smartphone users now are engaging with their devices while watching TV and have to do so on a daily basis. All you have to do is simply look around uh, your living room. By a show of hands, how many of you or a member of your family engage in that type of behavior? Looks like pretty much everyone. So um, what are people doing with these second screens? Here's a chart from Nielsen that shows that what smartphone users are doing in gray while tablet users are displayed in orange. Um, now one activity, number one activity is surfing the web, but the second most popular activity is a hub, shopping. And this is something direct marketers are familiar with because we're well aware that there's an immediate spike in online activity um, immediately after a spot airs. And um, that phenomenon we'll get into a little bit more detail a little, a little later on. So what are the implications of all this for direct marketers? Well, TV and radio clearly remain the most mass of mass media. Um, clearly the, the, the ability to watch what we want, when we want, poses a challenge to the traditional interruptive model of, of mass TV advertising. And we're seeing these trends you know, affect our business now. Um, today, DRTV may not always produce uh, an instant sale. It certainly can, but nowadays it's more likely to act as a vehicle that creates awareness. And then based on that awareness, a prospect's curiosity is peaked and, can, and the consideration process begins. DRT is really a catalyst for pr priming the traditional sales funnel like the one you see on the screen. I'm sorry. Right here. Another trend we're seeing is the over the top ad serving uh, where traditional cable or a dish provider um, are bypassed um, is increasing. That's when someone uses something like an Apple TV or a Roku type device. And the bottom line is that advertising content and locale, that is where the consumer discovers it, has to be relevant to the individual's consumer or they're simply going to tune us out. So I, I want to take a moment here to show you um, how Coke Zero partnered with Shazam in an attempt to align their content messaging with consumer behavior during ESPN's college game day. So let's take a look at that spot. Oh, man, that's good. Des, have you tried Coke Zero yet? Reese, Coke Zero? Man, I wish every fan could try this. <laughs> how are you going to do that? Watch this. Everybody at home, grab your smartphone, open up Shazam. I got it. I didn't think you even knew what Shazam was. How'd you think I got into hip hop? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, Coke Zero is a 10 year old brand that's already a billion dollars in sales. And their research shows that if someone, uh, if a consumer samples their product, many of them will convert to using it. And I think this spot does a great job of of getting people to, to try it and then convert. So with that blend of offline and handheld technology, it's the perfect transition into the next subject, which is online, which is a huge, a huge topic. Let's start by going back to this chart and reviewing the numbers. Now, the top three tiers of percentages represent from the top to the bottom, the percentage of overall media time spent with tablets in purple, smartphones in orange, and PCs in power blue. Now, to make it uh, 
a little easier for you. Um, in this chart, uh, I've added up the combination of the different devices uh, so that um, I give you the aggregate per percentages by age groups. Not surprisingly, millennials and Generation Xers spend the most amount of time online. But what are people doing online? So according to Comscore at the end of last year, 19% of their time is spent shopping. I mean, I'm sorry, spent actually social networking, followed by multimedia at 12%, and then retail, which presumably means shopping, uh, comprises 5% of behavior. And then over on the right, we have other at four, 34%, which sounds to me much better than the term porn. So. <laughs> okay. So one of the things we know that people are doing for sure online is shopping. Um, a recent survey from Comscore indicates that 51% of shopping purchases were made online by those surveyed. And I suspect what they're referring to is the time people spend uh, researching, browsing online for products versus time actually strolling through a traditional retail mall. And in that sense, that claim makes perfect sense. So uh, one thing that's clear is that uh, online is online shopping is continuing to siphon off sales from traditional retail. Uh, E-commerce sales reached 351 billion last year, and that still only represents 7% of domestic retail sales. But if you factor out automobiles and fuel, it rises to about 10.5%. And get this, the year-over-the-year -year growth rate was 14.6%. But more importantly, that represents 60% of total retail sales growth. So the trend is really clear, and there's virtually unlimited upside for online retailers. And yes, there are some victims, uh, including traditional retailers, especially mall anchor stores, uh, which are struggling for re relevance. You may have heard that Macy's recently announced plans to close 200 stores. But take a look at this. Um, Macy's ranks fifth overall in online sales among the leading retailers. Um, now take a look at Amazon. Uh, their, their estimated annual sales last year were 80 billion, while second place Walmart was at 13 and a half billion. So they really dwarfed them in terms of size. And you may have heard that um, recently Walmart purchased Jet.com for three billion dollars. Um, they're competing with, they were competing with Amazon, and uh, the company wasn't even making a profit, but they purchased them for three billion dollars. So Walmart's really looking to try to catch up. Um, but yeah, everyone's really looking to catch up with Amazon, and they they continue to add millions of Prime members who are spending ninety nine dollar a year on, on fees. And those fees can be used to offset profit margins that nobody else in the marketplace can match. I would, you know, one way to think of them is like Costco on steroids. Uh, believe it or not, Costco makes 75% of their 3.2 billion in operating profit from membership fees. And they vow to try not to mark up anything more than 11%. So you can imagine how much Amazon makes in profit from membership fees. Another trend we're seeing is that online video, um, on, online video is, is becoming more and more pop, popular. Check this out, having a video on your landing page can increase conversion by 80%. And, and in at least one campaign I know of, um, their close rate quadrupled when they had a video, a relevant video, on their landing page. And more and more of that video content is being viewed on YouTube, um, which is now the second largest search engine behind Google. It's owned by Google, 
but um, it now possesses three billion views a month. That's a lot of views. And nine out of 10 viewers um, say seeing a video about a product is helpful in their decision-making process. And here's the thing, it's not just your own video content you have to be concerned about. You have to worry about um, vloggers who do product reviews. Um, there's things called shopping haul videos, how to videos to contend with. And many of those rank really high in terms of keyword search. So marketers really have to vigilantly monitor uh, what's going on in regards to their brand and, um, and, and products because this is having an influential role on how consumers view your brand. Okay. Um, some more cr quick facts about online video. Nearly half the users take some sort of action after vi viewing a video ad. And to give you a sense of how much velocity uh, online video has, more videos have been uploaded in the last 30 days than NBC, ABC, and CBS networks created in the last 30 years. I mean, just think about that. It, that's like staggering. In the last 30 days, more content was created um, online in terms of videos than by the th three big networks in the last three decades. And of course, pre-roll ads are, are one of the ways that advertisers can use video. Though, you know, there's an obvious challenge how to, uh, how to get someone not to skip uh, through the ad. Um, so here's a clever example of, of what Geico did. And I'll show you. Don't thank me. Thank the savings. You can't skip this Geico ad because it's already over. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. But it doesn't end there. He's hungry. This is like dinner time at my house. <laughs> um, so did that keep your attention? I mean, that went on for 60 seconds. And I, I, I think it, um, it really uses humor cleverly to lower your expectations and get you, you know, to tune in and not skip through the ad. And Geico is all about impression-based, in-your-face advertising. And this is a brilliant tactic executed flawlessly. In fact, this ad won AdAge's Campaign of the Year for 2016. So now let's talk about mobile, um, which is also experiencing explosive growth. Let's, uh, let's start with some quick uh, numbers about mobile. Um, nearly 8 out of 10 mobile su subscribers now have a pocket-sized computer, their smartphone, in their possession. That represents over 207 million devices in the US. And the average smartphone user now spends over three hours a day on their phone. And researchers disagree on how many times people look at their phone a day, but eMarketer says it's 46 times a day, and then Forrester says it's uh, 150 to 200 times a day, which I think is probably more accurate. Um, and uh, it's also suggested that you know, smart, the smartphone is actually more addictive than cocaine. <laughs> so um, put together, that's, we're talking about billions of daily mobile moments. And uh, then there's also apps. And on the two major platforms, they each have over two million different apps. So the numbers are, are staggering. 
But increasingly, our mobile devices um, are becoming an extension of ourselves um, and, and an indispensable extension. I left my phone for a, a minute in the other room and I panicked before coming on stage. <laughs> but 73% um, uh, of, our, of us have our mobile devices with us all the time. And at night, it's right there with us by our bedside. 3% go to bed with it in their hand. 13% um, keep it on their bed. And 55% keep it on their nightstand. Um, and get this, one out of 10 admitted to looking at their phone during sex. <laughs> Sad but true. <laughs> In terms of shopping, mobile's playing an increasingly important role. We all are already talked about second screen behavior, but take a look at this. 45% of all shopping journeys contain a mobile action, according to Facebook. And one in three omnichannel shoppers um, use their smartphone to, to conduct product research. And over one in three omnichannel shoppers anticipate doing more research on their phones. And over six in 10 use their mobile devices in the retail aisle. Let's talk about uh, now showrooming and webrooming. Has, it, has everyone heard of those terms? Are they new? Okay. Um, so the first one is a phenomenon called showrooming. That's when someone browses in a store and then buys online. 51% of consumers do that. And then we have um, uh, the term webrooming. Uh, where consumers browse online and then go to a traditional retail store. And Nielsen reports that six out of 10 consumers do that. And Google reports that 82% of smartphone users use their phone in the retail aisle uh, in order to help them make a, a purchase decision. So what are the implications of this for direct marketers? Good customer experience is really crucial. Um, when it comes to mobile, you have to consider both the context, that is where they are and what they're doing, and the content, meaning the mobile content needs to be optimized for a smooth and satisfying experience. Sounds like a cigarette commercial. but um, That's why SEO and SEM are so critical in this context. Um, the consumer has got to be able to find you and not some hateful vlogger so you lose control over their purchase journey. And then there's a the matter of price. Um, look what happens when I Googled Big Easy Grill online. I'm not sure if you could see it, but the star rating's awesome. It's almost, um, it's almost a five. But look at the disparity in price uh, and it goes from maybe 161 um, at Walmart all the way up to 219 on QVC. So in this instance, the marketers lost control over the price because it's all over the place. Let's talk a little bit about apps. Um, and you know, I think there's a misconception among marketers that once someone downloads an app, you know, they're golden, you're gonna be rich, um, and you don't have to market to those people anymore, but that's not the case. I mean, look at this stat. 90% of users spend their time in apps compared to the mobile web, which is good. Um, on the other hand, you have to be set up for success and have an app that engages the consumer in a meaningful way. The download is really just the beginning. Uh, one in four, like 25% of people abandon the app after the first use. I mean, I'm sure if you look at your phone, you have apps you haven't used for a long period of time. And, um, and nearly one in two app users are unhappy with their app experience. So there's a lot of bad apps out there. However, promotions like discounts and ex exclusive bonus content are appealing to consumers, as you can see from the last stat. 
So let's look at an example of an app done right. Um, this is from L'Oreal, their Makeup Genius app. Um, I know Rick uses it, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if anyone else has used it yet. But um, this app takes the image of your face in real time, and like a mirror, and it uses a 3D imaging technology to apply virtual makeup. And the technology captures 64 different points in your face. I'm not sure if you knew you had 64 points in your face, but and up to 100 expressions um, to, help them, to help them create a virtual makeup look that's realistic, and it moves naturally as your face changes expressions. And you know the app users can choose between individual products or customized looks um, as they try it on. They can scan barcodes um, and try a, a, a shade on in store, so and then they can, and and then um, it also includes options for, you know, saving saving it and sharing your makeovers over social media. In other words, they give you a very personal experience and reasons to return. And this has been a very uh, successful app for L'Oreal. We have a client that has a really good app. They um, that's a little bit similar to this. They make customized shirts, um, and you hold it, hold the phone in front of you. It takes a picture of your body. And it's with a laser, and it gets a perfectly customized shirt uh, for seventy-five dollars. They send it to you, um, and a customized shirt usually costs a lot more than that, and they typically fit perfectly. So, um, speaking of social media, let's talk about its role in the marketing landscape. Here are the big players. Um, as you can see, Facebook and YouTube dwarf everyone else. Um, but in terms of certain younger demographics, uh, Instagram and Snapchat are really part of their daily social interaction. Um, Facebook buying Instagram may be the best business purchase uh, of ever, ever. Um, yeah, I believe they spent a billion dollars on the purchase of Instagram, and today it has a value of 50 billion, and is driving, is one of the biggest drivers of Facebook's growth. I mean, to me, that's incredible. That's, in a few years, that Instagram grew from a billion to 50 billion in valuation. They probably couldn't have done it without Facebook. So let's talk about um, some of the best practices in social media. Um, first thing to understand that each of us has a uh, persona, and part of that persona consists of brands. You know, the car we drive, the credit card we carry, the clothes we wear, and People want to take an active role and, and engage with the brands they feel passionate about. But they, in order for them to remain loyal to your brand, they have to feel good about it. And that's why social media engagement is so important. Uh, many social media experts caution that you need to observe the 80-20 rule uh, and not make all your engagement self-serving. Um, so that's a challenge for a lot of direct marketers who want to launch into the call to action right away. Um, so what does that mean? It means that 80% of your content should consist of relevant, shareable posts. So here are some examples. Tips and tricks, responses to posts of your community, um, your non-promotional company information. You might highlight your employees. Um, their passions, their lifestyles. You can even, you know, that gives your brand a human face, uh, especially if it's an online brand. And you can even highlight job openings. Then about 20% or two out of 10 of the post should be promotional in nature. You, and you also, also should use relevant hashtags to make it easy for your brand evangelists to, um, to, to share content and talk about your brand. And then really you have to engage with people on an emotional level. 
um, through storytelling, humor, testimonials, anything that helps to reinforce their passion. So let's look at an example of um, social media done right. In this case, it's Facebook um, done by Beachbody. Um, Beachbody um, is a direct marketer who works very hard to find this balance. I, I'm sure everyone knows someone who's done P90X or Insanity, Insanity, one of their workout routines, and a lot of times they're jacked up about the results and about their relationship with the company. So here's their Facebook feed to give you some examples. So on the left they have um, a recipe, let's call that a tip, and in the middle is an article addressing some common fitness myths. That's kind of neutral information to designed to you know, create engagement without being self-serving. And on the right, they highlight someone's transformation. And imagine how good this woman feels about over 500 strangers complimenting her on her transformation. Next um, is an example of Twitter done right with the GoPro. What GoPro does is they highlight consumers through daily photo of the day and video of the day, and then they tweet and retweet that content from consumers. And what this does is it helps to cement the relationship between brands and their public, and it builds community and loyalty. Um, earlier I mentioned uh, social proof, and I just want to briefly highlight how essential that is in terms of managing your company's uh, reputation in a proactive manner. Get this, 88% of consumers trust online reviews as much as personal recommendations. I mean, that means that they're trusting total strangers to influence their buying decisions. I mean, that, that's mind-boggling. And only 12% of consumers say they don't read online reviews. So online reviews are incredibly important. And additionally, if you include online reviews on your website, it helps with organic traffic. So let's look at a, um, a company. I don't know if you, any of you have heard of Joybird, but this is a company that really has a commitment to personal engagement with their consumers. Um, they sell mid-century modern furniture made to order. So like Zappos, they're really a paradigm shift for their industry. And they're asking you to order furniture online, sight unseen, you can't sit in it, touch it. Um, and the advantage of Joybird is that unlike um, West Elm, is anyone familiar with West Elm? Um, like West Elm might have a couch in three colors, Joybird will have the same couch in a hundred colors. And they can do that because they're selling it online. And, but the reviews are really a tale of two cities. You have really happy, satisfied consumers with five-star reviews who talk about the virtues of the company. And you have one-star reviews, um, unhappy customers complete, uh, typically complaining about the waiting time. So let's look at how Joybird manages that community. Here's a great five-star review, every marketer's dream. But Joybird really doesn't just take that for granted. Um, here they have taken the time to thank this guy, John, for his glowing review. And then there's the uh, flip side. This is a one-star review and from someone who is clearly frustrated. And a lot of companies and a lot of companies in this industry might just you know, run for cover and not address the problem. But in this case, the biz business manager was proactive and took the time to publicly address the problem, and she attempts to fix it. So what do you think that says to prospective buyers about how you treat your customers and the degree to which you care? It really takes an impersonal situation and makes it very personal. So they did a really good job of um, addressing, addressing uh, people online. Um, the next 
and final topic is um, the impact all of this is having on mass, on mass retail, and in addition to the store closures we talked about earlier. Okay. Oops, sorry. So offline and online advertising is really becoming a powerful for, force for educating consumers and driving purchase intent at traditional re mass retail. Having a, you know, a brand that means something is, is one way you can stand out at mass retail. Um, but with the trend towards white labeling, having a me meaningful brand that is um, per perceived as superior couldn't be more important. Think about what happens when you go into a drugstore and you're offered a generic at a much lower price um, to, the, to the name brand. Uh, how often do you pay a premium because you know, with a product, say, like, like NyQuil, because your belief is um, the brand is better, or that the store brand might not live up to the same expectations. So a meaningful brand helps prevent a product from becoming a commodity and helps protect your shelf space from competitors. And mobile plays a huge role in retail aisle as, you know, consumers comparison shop, they're reading reviews in the stores, and price shopping. Finally, let's take a look at a, a brand that was built on DR. Um, if you look at how successful Europro has been, they're now known as Ninja. Um, they're, they've, they've used direct marketing to educate consumers and become a category leader in housewares. I mean, who would have thought just 10 years ago that the red hot Sofia Vergara for a modern family would be their spokesperson. But there you have it, that's the power of effective omni-channel direct marketing. So I hope this has been helpful and I'd like to leave a little time to open it up to questions. Any questions? Comments? What do you think about, um, on YouTube, there's been a debate like with one of my clients that we'll see like somebody with no production values doing like a product review getting 2 million reviews and then our slick video gets 2,400. Um, so the question that's arisen is, should we not be doing slick content? Should we be doing stuff that looks more like you know, home-generated content. What do you think? I mean, I, I think it really has to be um, organic and natural. Um, if it's, if, if it's overproduced um, and too slick, I think sometimes it turns off people. Um, I think things just happen virally sometimes on, on YouTube. And um, it's really not the necessarily the production value. It's how you connect with the consumer um, on an emotional level or through the story you're telling. Um, that's really what's most important. Any other questions? Yes. So with, with all this, I guess, um, with the social media and, and cross-channel, what methods do you have for attribution? How do you sort of, you know, where's the proof in the pudding a little bit? And, and how do you think about attribution? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we look at um, all f at a attribution of all forms of media nowadays um, because in today's marketing universe, um, typically someone is running an omni-channel campaign. So we, my agency has put a lot of time and resources into building out an attribution model that looks at all the different channels and assesses how they're all impacting um, the overall performance. And it's not perfect, but we're getting better at it. You know, obviously TV, if you're running TV, it drives all channels and uh, still drives the most people online. And certain types of media work well together. So if you're running, you're offline and online simultaneously, uh, for instance, if you're running TV and you're running a pay-per-click campaign, it's easier for someone to find your site, so you're going to get better conversion. But 
all channels are important. Um, you know, so we, we're kind of media agnostic. Uh, we operate in all channels, and um, uh, we're constantly trying to improve our media, our, our media mix modeling and attribution to figure out what's driving the most response, the most conversion, and the most profit. So we're all about results. Anyone else? Well, um, thank you for attending. And I'm Peter Copel for, from Copel Direct. And if you have any other questions, I'll be up here for a little while to answer them. Thank you. Thank you.